Hey, everyone, and welcome to the All It Takes is a Goal podcast, the best place in the entire world, including all of Canada, to learn how to build new thoughts, new actions, and new results. I'm your host, John Acuff, and today I'm joined by Josh Linkner. Who's that? Well, as always, I'm very glad that you asked that specific question. Josh Linkner has been the founder and CEO of five tech companies, which sold for a combined value of over $200 million. I would probably even round that up to a quarter bill. Like, I would probably, that's what I would say if I was him. I'd be like, well, I mean, it's a quarter billion. You, you maybe have heard of the word billion, but he's more humble than that. He's the author of four books, including the New York Times bestsellers, Discipline Dreaming, and The Road to Reinvention. This guy just loves starting and building companies. He's the founding partner of Detroit Venture Partners, and he's been involved in the launch of over 100 startups. Today, Josh serves as the chairman and co-founder of Platypus Labs, an innovation research training and consulting firm. He has twice been named the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, and is a recipient of the United States Presidential Champion of Change Award. Josh is also a passionate Detroiter. Did I say that right? Detroiter? Do they, is, it, is that how it's pronounced? Or is it just called like the kid rocker? I don't know. It's Detroiter, I think. He's the father of four, a professional level jazz guitarist, and has a slightly odd obsession for greasy pizza. And he's my friend. We've known each other for years now, and he's one of the public speakers, entrepreneurs, and leaders that I look up to. He's got a brand new book out called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. I can't wait for you to hear this episode. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Remodel Health. Navigating health benefits can be a struggle, especially for leaders who wear so many different hats within their organization. Luckily, you don't have to stress about picking the perfect plan for your team. Thanks to Remodel Health, you can get tailored health benefits that fit your organization's needs. Their in-depth, personalized approach to health benefits allows you to discover more options, serve employees better, and control the cost and quality of your health benefits like never before. What's more, Remodel customers save an average of 56% on health benefits. Imagine what you could do with savings like that. With their dedicated team of compassionate healthcare experts and consultants, your organization can experience better benefits while still getting the hands-on individual care your people need. Are you ready to learn how Remodel Health could help your organization provide better benefits and find bigger savings? Remodel's benefits consultants can run a health benefits analysis on your unique team to evaluate your current plan and help you find a better alternative that saves you money and better meets the needs of your people. Head over to remodelhealth.com slash analysis today to learn more about the health benefits analysis and get your personalized evaluation. Let me spell that one because the word analysis can be tricky. I've never once spelled the word occasionally correct. So fortunately, it's not the word occasionally, but that, that word can be tricky. It's remodelhealth.com slash A-N-A-L-Y-S-I-S. Remodelhealth.com slash analysis. Experience better benefits and bigger savings with Remodel Health. All right, let's jump into the interview. I want you to listen for one particular thing. Midway through the interview, Josh and I are going to disagree about Legos, but you know what? We're able to come together. We're able to stay united. Even at a time when the country is very divided, we are able to come together in our love of Legos, even though we see Legos from very different perspectives. So listen up. Here's my conversation with my friend, Josh Linkner. All right. So excited that I get to talk to my buddy, Josh Linkner today. Josh, thank you so much for joining me. I've really been looking forward to this one. Likewise, as mentioned, I'm a huge fan of your work and uh, delighted to be part of the soundtrack for today. Awesome, man. Awesome. And so I want to jump right in. I've read your bio. I've shared the bio with the audience. There's a, there's a bunch of folks that are excited about all the things you've done. The most recent is you've got a new book called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And one of the taglines you use, one of the hooks, if you will, is helping everyday people become everyday innovators. What made you want to write this book? We both had books come out in the same month, which was really fun to have a friend come out in the same month. 
Um, and I get that question a lot. They'll say, well, why this book? Why this topic? So for you, because there's a million things you could have written about, why this topic? Well, first of all, I started my career, as, as you know, as a jazz guitarist. And so creativity and, and being able to problem solve has been really like my whole being since as long as I can remember. Put myself through college playing music. And and when I got into becoming a business person, I've, I've had the chance to start building and sell five companies and get about 100 other startups off the ground. It was all based on creativity, frankly. I'm, I'm bad at most things. And, and human creativity, I felt like I was okay at. And so it's been a passion of mine since the beginning. But what has been frustrating to me is the way most people think of innovation and creativity. They think of it as this exclusive members only club for billionaires wearing hoodies that no one is allowed to join. And that's nonsense. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You know, human creativity really is the great equalizer and it allows all of us, it's accessible to us all. So I wanted to write a book that democratized innovation, that allowed ordinary people to use creativity doing the jobs that they're doing now. You don't have to become a lab coat wearing tech nerd. You can use creativity to become a better uh, mom or better dad or, or better uh, at sales or trying a case in front of a jury or being a dentist. So it's the notion of dispelling the myths and providing a really fun and practical system to cultivate creativity in order to drive better outcomes, both in business and life. I, I love that. And I think that I love how wide the book is for so many different people, because I think you're right. I think sometimes I would say we often think creativity is um, it's for tech billionaires or it's for artsy people. Sometimes people say, I'm not creative. What they mean is I'm not my definition of artsy. And so therefore I'm not creative. And I think that's a mistake. But you said something fascinating in that last exchange that I want to stop on for a second that most people don't say. You said, I put myself through college as a jazz guitarist. That is 100% the first time someone has said that sentence on this podcast. And I don't want to rush by that. What does that mean? Were you always a goal person? Because that, I mean, that's a unique thing to do. Not everybody can say that. Walk us through the experience of, okay, I fell in love with guitar. I then fell in love with jazz guitar. I then used it as a vehicle to provide my college education. Well, I was really passionate about music as, as a kid. And I didn't, you know, I played piano a little bit and started on guitar. And like every kid playing guitar, I wanted to play Stairway to Heaven so I could get a date because that was my only mechanism for attracting yeah. girls. And uh, but, but I had a guitar teacher that said, listen, if you really want to get good, learn jazz. If you can play jazz, you can play anything. And that like opened the door for me. And then I just fell in love with the art form. And, and not, I know that not everybody loves listening to jazz, but it's this beautiful thing. It's sort of this raw, dangerous art form. Let's say you and I were playing jazz in a group together. We could play the same song every night for the next 10 years and every night it's going to be different. So it's really like a musical conversation, just like you and I didn't script today's chat. We're just kind of riffing off of each other. That's what jazz is all about. And so I love the rawness of it. And it's just this, 99% of what you play, you make up as you go. So it's expressive and, and just complicated and intricate. And I dig it. So anyway, I, I started playing jazz and got, got fairly good at it and had some accolades. And when it came time to college, like I, I had to put myself through school and I could pump gas and I was okay at that. But, but I decided instead I'd play some music and I played a lot. I mean, I played, you know, seven, nine, gigs a week sometimes. I spent time out on a cruise ship playing, earning up money to go back to school. Uh, there, were, there were times when I was actually starting my first business when I was 20. I would play jazz gigs every night till like two in the morning, come back and crash for a couple hours. And then like at 8 a.m. I showed up trying to start this business and doing college in between and like rinse and repeat. So it was a caffeine fueled education. I love that. And I love that. I think sometimes people go, okay, I want to do this thing and I don't know how to do it. And it has, there's only five options. There's only four options. But I love when people can create their own option and becoming a jazz guitarist and putting yourself through school, being on the cruise ship, you know, building your side hustle. Um, I, I love that approach. Have you always been wired to look for a big challenge that inspires you? I mean, we're talking about creativity. We're talking about inspiration. And what I mean by that is a teacher said, essentially, it'd be like saying, hey, if you want to get good at basketball, learn how to make an amazing half court shot because a layup will be easy in comparison. Have you always been wired to say, wow, I do want to try the hard thing. I do want to try jazz guitar because you're right, like 98 percent of people who get a guitar are going to get an acoustic guitar and learn Wonderwall by Oasis. And you you went into something that was much more complicated. Has that always been some a way you've approached life? I have. I've always said, you know, if you get, what, what's the maximum? You keep double clicking on something until it gets bigger and more complicated. And I've, I've, I've enjoyed pursuing that. But by the way, that doesn't come from um, arrogance or, or, or a sense that I'm going to get it right. It's funny. People ask me this often, like when you're playing jazz, you're making it up as you go. You're in front of a really critical audience and you're being judged. How do you know you're going to get it right? And the answer is, I know I will not, not get it right. I know with absolute 100% certainty, I will get it wrong. 
And I've never played a jazz. So I've played good. thousands of gigs. I've never gotten it right. And so the confidence doesn't come from knowing you're going to be perfect. It comes from knowing you're going to get messed up and then being willing to course correct, being able to understand, like, how do you bounce back? And that, to me, what creativity is, is what creativity is all really all about. It's not drawing on the walls with purple crayons. It's figuring out how to use creativity to solve problems and seize opportunities. I, I love that. So as you explored this book, one of the things that was really interesting to me because you can tell, even in the first couple of minutes of our conversation, you're a deep explorer. When you have an idea, when you have a curiosity, you go to a deep level of exploration. You did more than a thousand hours of research, interviews with billionaires, celebrities, a lot of different people. What surprised you about what you learned? What was something that you said, wow, I went in thinking this and this was different, or I was surprised when I, I started to see a pattern between these 20 successful people. What surprised you about the research? Yeah, so as mentioned, you know, I, I did spend a lot of time. I did academic research, neuroscience, you know, I mean, on and on. And, and it was actually really cool. I tried to study, you know, like kind of break down what are the habits and mindsets and tactics of the most innovative people of all shapes and sizes in all industries around the world. The, the one thing that was really interesting to me is the notion of revisions. So very often we think of, of, of a creative act as this lightning bolt from the heavens, and then it launches with perfection, and it launches to everybody, and it's, you know, this global thing. And, and the best of the best rarely do that. In fact, what they do is they come up with an idea that usually is pretty flawed, and they tweak it and adapt it and, and, and riff on it. And it's often the number of revisions that's the, the difference between something really good and, and mediocre. There's a great line, which I know you, you can appreciate as an author, is that the one thing that all authors have in common, all great authors, is lousy first drafts. And so yeah. the initial act is important, but that's not the only thing. It's about the ongoing micro innovations and tweaks and revisions that really gets, gets you to the finish line. Lady Gaga, I wrote about in the book, she said that when she writes a piece, she, she said like the first 15 minutes, it's sort of her like throwing up ideas onto the page and just spewing a bunch of nonsense. And then it might take two years for her to take that material and refine it into the song that you ultimately hear. And I think very often we don't think of creativity and innovation that way. We think it's got to be perfect upon ideation. And if it's not, shame on us. And it really can be a much more deliberate, systematic way to take an initial idea that's flawed and over time shape it into something that's valuable. How do you, because you, you lead a team, you're also a dad, Maybe I'm a dad listening. Maybe I'm a mom listening. Maybe I'm a CEO or a manager at a mid-sized credit union, and I want to help create a culture of revision. I don't want revisions to be the um, unusual thing. I want us to have a culture of revision, but I know people are going to be afraid of that because they think it has to be perfect right out of the gate. They want to look like, you know, like they're a hero right away. How would you help somebody lead a culture where revision is the norm, revision is accepted, revision is, dare I say, celebrated? Yeah, so the book that I just wrote, Big Little Breakthroughs, is kind of the, the, the essence of it. So when most people think of innovation, they think of moonshots. They think of, I've got to have a billion dollar change the universe idea, or it doesn't count. Big Little Breakthroughs is the opposite. It's coming up with small, little, teeny ideas all the time, like micro-innovations, little, teeny, tiny, baby ideas. And so if you have a culture that is based on high volume of little baby ideas, and it's everybody's job to be an innovator in that context. First of all, by the way, it's way less risky. It's way more accessible to everybody. But back to your question about revisions, that's just part of the deal. So if you have a culture of little, teeny ideas, it's by definition the, a culture of experimentation because that little, teeny idea may not be the, the big, big thing you're looking for. So it's the common, you build one little idea onto another, and then you add another one to it. And so you sort of embrace this as a deliberate process rather than waiting around for, for the silver bullet of innovation that never ends up coming to life. I love that it's everybody's job. It's everybody's role. Do you see um, sometimes in organizations where, because you, you speak around the world to hundreds of companies, where innovation, they go, okay, this department does innovation, this department does accounting, and they kind of wall off innovation? Absolutely, and it breaks my heart, man, because when I'm at some company, they're like, oh, they're the second floor, that's where the creatives sit. I'm like, what? What? Like, if you have a 100,000 person company, you should have 100,000 creatives. And again, it gets back to your point about how do we define creativity? If you have someone in customer service, absolutely you want them being creative. If you have someone in accounting, you know what? I want them to be creative. Now, most people, when you hear that, say, oh, yo, you're going to break the law. Of course not. You obviously will be responsible. But even if someone in a traditional role that is 
anti-creative like accounting, why not use the numbers to create better insights for, for improved decision making? Why not be able to present a report in a way that's more creative and that people can understand? So my point is that there is room for human creativity in every single job, in every box on an org chart. And for a company to really enjoy success, they have to tap all of them. I often liken that, uh, John, to like, like, let's say out in back of your house there in, in, in Nashville, you had an oil well and someone said, hey, good news, there's a billion dollars of oil sitting in your backyard. I'm pretty sure you're not going to say, nah, no thanks. I'm not that, I'm kind of busy. I'll just let that yeah. billion dollars sit there. You'd get after it. And I would say to most leaders, there's that oil well sitting in your company. There's this dormant creative capacity. That's the oil well. That's all this incredible stored value that's right there. And if you can create the conditions and, the, and a culture that supports instead of blocks the creativity, you're going to release this incredible value, which, care, which drives all the things we care about. It drives growth. It drives customer satisfaction. It drives, it drives new ideas. It drives morale and engagement and shareholder value and all that other good, good stuff. Well, one of the ways that you talk about tapping into that is the eight core obsessions of everyday innovators. Um, and I want to I want to talk a little about that. I want to start by saying, were you tempted to stretch it to 10? Because I respect that as an author, I really respect and trust an eight point list, because if I'm honest, as an author, you're tempted to go like, ah, 10 would be better. And you add two throwaways that aren't that good. And you stretch it out and you see other authors do that. Or it's a three-point list and they stretch it to five. But so were you tempted to stretch it to 10, but you were like, you know what? These are the eight fire ideas. <laughs> you know, it's funny you ask that. I, I think we're always as second guessing ourselves as authors. I have tons of moments yeah. like sure, you know, of all, you know, fear and doubt and you know, self-loathing and all that. But um, what happened was I it, it was really I tried to not not let that dictate the research. I tried to let what I discovered drive the book. And and I eventually came to these eight. And at first, by the way, it was like 20 and I, you know, cascaded mm -hmm. them together. But when I got down to eight, you know, like if you're dividing fractions at school, like it's got 50 over hundred and then it goes on to 20, 25 over 50. And, but eventually you can go no more. I got to those eight and I could go no more. And I said like, it can't be seven. I can't collapse this into three. I can't yeah. expand it into 10. These are the eight and I'm standing by it. So good. I really, just as a nerdy author thing, I really respect that. I want to kind of back up and go obsession. I think a lot of times people hear that word and they automatically assume a negative connotation. But I think that to be excellent, there's a degree of obsession. What does obsession mean to you, especially when it comes to innovation? An obsession, so a lot of times you say like habits or mindsets or whatever, to me, those feel like you use them when you feel like it. Whereas an obsession is sort of all encompassing. It's like part of who you are. It's, it seeps into your pores. It's like just part of your being. And so what I tried to say is not just what do the innovators do when they're having a good day? What do they do when they feel like it, when they've got a little extra time or money? Because who has that ever? I said, what do they like? What, what can't they live without? What, what drives their soul? And that's what these eight, these eight big ideas are. Most of them are counterintuitive. They're sort of the opposite of what we've been taught, which was actually really fun. I mean, if I was just spouting off platitudes that we already know, that wouldn't be much of a book. But most of these were pretty surprising. And I actually really enjoyed discovering them myself. Give us one. There's eight in there. I want people to check out the book, obviously, a um, little bit of a teaser. But what's one that you'd say, OK, if I was going to teach you one, we're sitting out for coffee, you're in Detroit. Um, here's one that I would teach you. It's like choosing one of your kids as your favorite. It's very difficult. I but, know, I know. Um, so one of them- It's like the I, Brady Bunch too. <laughs> so one of them is, um, is called Start Before You're Ready. And most people, I think, they see an opportunity or a challenge and, and, and then they wait. And they wait for permission or a directive from the boss or till their game plan is perfect or till they have ideal conditions. But there's an inherent risk in waiting in that you might miss the opportunity altogether or at best give up your head start. And so the most innovative folks among us do the opposite. They, they actually just get started in the face of ambiguity. Like they have no idea how they're going to get to the finish line, but they start anyway. And they don't give up those cycles. They, they realize they have to pivot and adapt and, and you know uh, shift around to changing circumstances. And they find their way by starting and adapting. I, th I think I've seen that happen in my own life this year um, because it's been an unusual year. Um, I don't know if other people had the pandemic where they live, but we had it in Nashville. And um, we had a team meeting in January, planned out the year. And then uh, an opportunity came up that we didn't even know existed, and it'll probably end up being 35 to 40% of our business for the year. And in January, when we planned, it didn't exist. And we're recording this in August, and now we're having another team meeting and go, okay, wait a second. We have all this new information. Let's adjust. Let's adapt and, and do the next six months and see what that looks like. And I, I think that 
one of the things I liked about the book was there were the obsessions, but there are also a ton of great stories that highlighted the obsessions, that illustrated the obsessions. Um, my favorite one, I'm a Lego guy. Um, I love Lego sets. I, I have, we're not recording this on video, but it, I'll show you, like, if you can see in the corner of the room, those are, it's the Ghostbusters car, it's Bugatti, it's the Porsche, it's the bigger Porsche, it's the Defender. Um, you look up top, there's, there's car, the VW bus, Porsche target, whatever. I love that you tell the Lego story. Can you explain that story? What, what made you fascinated about that? Well, like you, I'm a Lego geek. I mean, when I was a kid, I love Legos. And by the way, if you notice how Legos changed, like when I was a kid, building Legos, you, you'd have a whole bunch of Legos and you, you'd have to use your imagination. And the act of Legoing was you build something once and, and you break it apart and you build it again. And now you buy a set that's a cool Bugatti, but it's like, it's an act in following instructions rather than using your imagination. So I actually love the, I kind of yearn for those old days when it was more about imagination and creation rather than, you know, sort of following what, what you, you know, it's still cool, by the way, not, not being critical, but. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, no, yeah. I'll, I'll take that as an insult, but go on. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the Lego story that I told was about how Lego became the biggest toy company in the world in a really unlikely way. I mean, they sort of adapted all these changing circumstances and, and, and they kept reinventing themselves. So the chapter that was, was in was, was a chapter, another sort of surprising idea uh, called Break It to Fix It. And most of us have been told, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it and, and follow the formula and, and all these nonsense things that really get us into trouble because that might be fine if the world was a vacuum. But today we're living at a rate of change like none other in history. And that's just a, it's a, it's a fool's bet. And so break it to fix it. And what the Lego folks did is, you know, they started out manufacturing wooden toys. Then he figured out how to, in balloon Denmark, then he, then he figured out how to make plastic injection molding. And they, they used to make yo-yos and they made bricks and they just kept building and reinventing and reinventing inventing. Pretty soon they became a movie company. Pretty soon they have a theme park. And so they, they were able to let go of their previous worldview in favor of a new one on a very regular basis, which was, was one thing that I found fascinating about them. And it's funny, when you talked about your thing real quick, John, you said, hey, I, I just launched this product. It's 40% of my revenue. It actually ties to a couple other points. One of them in the book we talk about is fall seven times, stand eight. And the notion there is borrowed from a Japanese proverb. But the idea behind it is that adversity and setbacks are just part of life. I mean, no one planned for COVID. No one said, hey, I'd like some COVID, please. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. But but yet we're, we're dealing with it. And so we were all kind of knocked down, but instead of sort of wallowing in self-pity, you use your creativity to get back and not just do the same thing, but try something new. And so just celebrating that you actually applied one of those principles in, in, your, in your business. A hundred percent. I mean, that's why this podcast exists. Um, I I had to say, okay, what would have made this year easier? And and then I decided to go build that. So I said, okay, this year would have, 2020 would have been easier if I had a podcast, I could communicate ideas, it'd be a eventual revenue stream, it'd be another way for me to share with people, and I didn't have one. So I thought, okay, I can't wait for things to return. I'm going to create something. Um, and I love the fall seven times, rise eight. What's interesting, because I have the benefit of being your friend um, and that we've actually hung out before and I know a little about your business, I have kind of an insider view in that you do these kind of things with your company all the time. When you say, hey, here's an obsession, here's an idea, like for instance, you guys have a cultural operating system. And I met you two years ago in Detroit. I came to an event you do, a three ring circus, which is if you wanna be a public speaker, is an amazing event. Um, we'll link it in the show notes. Um, but I, you mentioned that in your, one of your speeches and I thought, oh, I've got to know more about that. I actually followed up with you personally and said, Hey, I'd love to see those. You sent them to me. They were things like play like you want to be remembered. Don't wait, be the Da Vinci of your, of our craft. And these are statements for your team. But the one I liked the most was compressed time. So one, tell us how you thought, you know what, as a leader, as a team, we're going to create these, we're going to live by these. Cause I think whether you're a leader or not, every individual should have some of these. I would call these soundtracks in my language, but how did you decide to come up with them and to explain compressed time? Because that one is one that I think would help anybody who's listening to a podcast about goals. Yeah. So th thanks for that, John. I, I'm glad you liked them. Um, so for me, I've, I've been building companies for 30 years. I've, I've had the chance to, you know, hire 10,000 people or so over the years. And, and in the past, I think, you know, it was, I was so focused on what we did as opposed to who we are. And, I, and, and now the days, as I've gotten a little bit older, I said, all right, you know, who are we? And, and I think that the who you are should really drive every decision that you make. And instead of me having to tell everybody exactly what to do every day, this becomes the, 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 the roadmap. If, if, we, if we live by these principles, you, don't, you, you can just, you can make the right decision. And so instead of them being really broad, like 
be creative, you know, which is a good thing, but it's how do you, what do you do with that? I tried to make them these little catchphrases so that if you're in a meeting, someone could say, all right, I'm, I'm stuck on something. Oh, let's rely on this compressed time. Now that's, that's, that's an actionable thing to do. So that, that's where we came up with them. It was through lots and lots of years and we're always refining them. But, but frankly, we really do live by these. I mean, just, they're not just like a platitude on the wall. Uh, I reverse engineered interview questions. So when I'm hiring people, I hire based on those values way more than what someone's resume says. Our annual reviews, literally, we will go through all of those and the, the, each team member self scores and then the leader scores. And you, you have a productive conversation about how they're contributing against each of those values. So these are deep in our culture. Internal emails rarely go by without a hashtag and one of those things written out. So, so they're front and center. We live them. We don't just stick them on the wall or in a folder. But anyway, real quickly, compressed time. Let's compress time. Yeah. Compressed time is the notion that most of us think about what we're going to do, but we don't think about the pace at which we're going to do it. And so time is always the, the denominator, but we rarely even talk about it. And so you saying, I'm going to do a podcast. Well, if you could spin it up in, in three months and, and versus three years, that might actually affect the decision altogether. But we very rarely, you know, deeply consider pace. So in our case, I believe that time is, is one of the most limited resources, clearly, and one of the, the biggest advantages that we can gain. So the notion of compressed time is, hey, instead of doing it in five cycles, can you do it in three? Hey, instead of this thing taking 17 meetings, is there a way we could do it in two emails? And so it's, 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 this ever present, like, you know, like a shoulder angel is like a timing yeah. saying, all right, come on. Like, there's got to be a faster way to do it. And it's not sloppy. It's not that, you know, the hare versus tortoise kind of thing. It's not being, you know, irresponsible, but it's saying, all right, let's, let's be really deliberate at how fast we can do something. And if we can accelerate time, if we can compress time, that becomes a competitive advantage. And I think what I liked about it, especially in this season we're in, is that I've talked to a lot of companies that because of COVID, had to do something that used to take six months in six weeks. And suddenly the bureaucracy fell aside and they said, you know what, we don't need to do it this long. We can compress the time and get it, you know, really like think about how many companies compress their work from home plan that might have said, OK, we're going to do a 12 month study. We're going to do 14 months of testing. And then all of a sudden it was like, hey, tomorrow people are going to need to work from home. So if you could figure that out, that would be great. I think there's so many examples this season of why that's such such a smart uh, principle. I want to shift a little bit. Um, we hinted at this with uh, Three Ring Circus and public speaking, um, but you're a really talented speaker. You do an amazing amount of gigs all around the world. I mentioned that. So let's say that I want to do public speaking. You have people come up to you and say, hey, I want to do what you do. I have people that say, hey, that was, that was interesting. Like, I'd like to be a public speaker someday. If I've never done a paid speech, if I'm just, but I've got the itch. I'm like, that looks like a fun, I think it's the best job in the world. I tell people that all the time. Like getting to be on the front row of watching life change as you share ideas is, is amazing. What would you tell somebody that's sitting there? Like, what are the first three things they should do if you want to be a public speaker? So we're really passionate about this. You know, I, I, like you, became a speaker years ago, and I've had the great privilege to do over a thousand keynotes all around the world. And uh, like you also, I take it seriously. I mean, you know, it's not just mailing it in. It's not a, you know, a hobby. You know, it's a profession and a craft. And I realized that there were so few legitimate, high-quality training programs. You can learn how to be a heart surgeon, but how do you learn to become a professional speaker? And so we ended up starting a business five or so years ago called Three Ring Circus, where we help people. We help people who are new to the industry. We like to say people of substance who have something to say, we help them build and launch and scale their speaking practice. And we also help people who are experienced speakers go up in terms of fee and volume and impact. So I do have some experience here. We've had, I literally helped hundreds of people do just what you're describing. The first thing I think, though, is recognizing that there are three interconnected businesses if you want to actually be a professional speaker. You have to be a promoter, which is sort of like marketing and branding and demand creation and how do you price and how do you interact with speaker bureaus? And like, there's a whole discipline around promoting yourself. You also have to be a thought leader, which is having something to say. In your case, you write fabulous books and you have a point of view on something and you reveal surprising truths rather than spout, you know, cliches and platitudes. So you're an expert at something. So you have to be an expert. And then the third thing is you actually have to be a performer, which is actually being pretty good on stage. And you are hysterically funny. You have the, the, the com comedic skills of a, of a professional and you're great on stage and you light the room up. So in other words, if you had only two of those, it wouldn't work. If you were a rich substance and you were a good marketer, but you fell apart on stage, wouldn't work. If you were great on stage, but had nothing of substance to say, you'd be a plaid jacket wearing cliche spouting cheese ball. And so for someone to be really effective at the highest levels, you have to be thinking deliberately about how am I going to be a promoter? How am I going to be an expert? And how am I going to be a performer? Which one do you see people having the hardest time with? Which is a general question, but 
I'm curious from your perspective, is there one that you go, those are the three? And I, I completely agree. I talk to people about those ideas all the time. Which of those three do you think trips people up the most if they want to be a public speaker? Such a great question, man. And it's, it's also really difficult because I think they really are inter- interdependent. I'm not trying to be, be a politician and not answer your question. I think people believe that they have a marketing problem when they may have a substance or delivery problem. Hmm. So they might think, hey, I gave the greatest speech at my aunt's wedding. Everybody loves me when I tell jokes to my friends. And, oh, I've got so much to say. I could tell war stories for years up on end. I just need you to promote me. And the problem is that, and I'm not trying to be critical, by the way, everyone starts someplace and it's great that you can tell a great speech at your aunt's wedding, but that alone does not make you a professional. And so I think that many people believe they have a marketing problem, but they don't, what, what they don't have is something that is, is substance and, and, and content that the world wants to hear in a way they want to hear it. And perhaps they don't have the delivery skills that they think they have. By the way, they may have awesome promise. I, mean, I sucked for years and years and years. I still probably suck. So, you know, but, but it's having a commitment to being an actual professional. Just like if you were in your school, high school play, doesn't mean you're yet a Broadway performer. So I, I do think that each of them requires sort of deliberate focus. And the good news, by the way, I'm not trying to be negative. The good news is all of these can be improved. And there, there's a, it's a huge business for those that want to pursue it seriously. And that's what we love doing. We love helping people up their game across all three of those vectors. Well, and that was what I found when I went. I attended the event um, in Detroit two years ago, which is when we first met. Um, and I was taking tons of notes, learned a bunch and found it really encouraging to see this next generation too of speakers that were going, okay, I want to learn this. You were sharing road wisdom. One of the stories you told that I thought was interesting is you did four speaking engagements in a day, which is insane. Like I've done two before and two is amazing, but two is challenging logistically. So four is almost physically impossible. It's a huge goal. This is a goal setting podcast. How are you able to accomplish that? What are some things that you'd say, you know what? It was a big goal, but I think if you want to do a big goal, these three things are kind of the things you need to think about, or you always need to, you know, to think about this challenge or this opportunity. Tell that story because it's one that I I still have a hard time with. It's so crazy. (laughs) Well, one of my beliefs is this notion that you can find a way that like there's a way to solve just about any problem. And obviously I cover that a lot in, in the book. And the second one, back to the, your, your question about compressed time. So if you're a keynote speaker, you know, you, your time is, is, is what you, you have to offer. And, and if you can do two in one day, you're like, man, I just beat the clock. How awesome is that? I, I banged out two, you know, fabulous. And so what happened was I've always said, that, you know, could you do more? And I'm always like curious, back to your earlier question, you know, looking for what's the biggest, you know, iteration or, or version of something. Uh, and it was jazz guitar for playing music. And then I said, hmm, maybe we could compress time. So what ended up happening is it, it sort of fell together. I, I had done two before many times. And the way you normally do two is, you know, we're, we're in the great fortunate spot, you and I, that we we have, you know, very, we're, we're luxurious and I, I don't take it for granted fees. So we can afford to, if you have to go from like Chicago to Nashville, you can, you can fly on a private plane and, and you can get there safely and on time. And so anyway, what happened was this. I got an opportunity to speak uh, here in Detroit, my hometown, for Siemens, big company, awesome, great. So it was like an early morning speech. Then I got a call from Verizon and they said, hey, can you possibly do a late evening, like a dinner speech in New Jersey? And I was like, oh man, I got all the time in the world for sure. Like high five, we got two in one day. So then I get a call from HSBC Bank who was doing an event in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut in the like mid afternoon. I was like, no way. Could I do this? Could I pull off three? And like, I'm getting all jazzed up and I'm like, you know, itching at it and I'm trying to figure it Uh out. And before I figured it out, I get a call from P&G, who was an existing client and said, listen, any way you could do noon in Montreal, and I was like, oh man, we're gonna make this happen. And it was just crazy. Like we, we planned this thing like choreographing like a country invasion if you were a military you know, flight or something. So we're, we're like, I have multiple people and we're orchestrating every minute and coming up with backup plans. So what happened is I banged it out in, 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 in Detroit, private plane to, to Montreal, raced back to the airport. Everything is perfect. We're all ready to go until I'm getting on the plane to Montreal, not a second to lose. And I left my bag on the stage in Montreal. So I left my laptop, my notes, my passport, my wallet, everything. And I had no time to turn back. So this is one of those like, oh man, like that, that's not a good moment. I had thousands of people waiting for me to be in front of, like I I couldn't go back. So 
We get on the plane. We had Wi-Fi. We're like communicating with the the, uh, the customs agents in, in in New York. We're we're sending them digital pictures of my passport. So I landed on the ground in there. I had to like spend 15 minutes like begging my way into the country. Race to the thing. I got to the the, the the event with like four minutes to spare. Ended up taking a helicopter from that to the last speech and made it home to Detroit by 11 p.m. Four speeches later, done and done. That is crazy. And I love, I think what I really enjoy is that your enthusiasm and your passion for what you're getting to do really comes through. Um, There's a genuine appreciation. There's a genuine gratefulness. There's a genuine excitement. Um, There's nobody that would listen to that story and go, I don't know if he really likes what he, what he does for a living. I don't really know. So maybe I'm listening to this right now and I feel a little stuck. I don't have that same energy. Maybe I feel like I'm not living up to my full potential. If somebody said to you, okay, Josh, I don't feel like I'm living up to my full potential. What kind of advice would you give them? Well, I love just emphasizing the word your potential, you know, because like I can sit around and say, I, I, I suck because I'm not Elon Musk and he's more creative than I am and he's wealthier and it's SpaceX and man, am I a loser here, here in Detroit. So I think one of the issues is not comparing to others, but taking an inward look and say, all right, what was my calling? What, what's, what's right for me? And, and by the way, there are multiple dimensions. Elon Musk famously talks about how he has no life balance whatsoever. You, I know you run a thousand miles a year or whatever, you're in terrific shape. So you made that a priority. So when you think about life, it's like you, you want to you wanna optimize across multiple planes. It's not only going going crazy and one at the expense of others. So when you, someone says your potential, again, I think you, it's a broader question than just, you know, can I make more money or can I be more famous or something? Mm-hmm. It doesn't always have to be an external thing you're shooting for. That being said, I think the, the way to approach that would be, to me, I always like things that are pragmatic. Even though I'm like a creative person, I'm a pragmatic creative. I don't know if that's even a term, but what I would do is mm-hmm. say, okay, what does that full potential look like? And, and, and is it, first of all, is it the right target? Like, is your full potential because you want to look like someone on, on, on Instagram? Or is that something that you really believe in your heart that you want to be remembered 40 years later, you know? So, so it's really locking in a, a, an attention of purpose and potential that is certainly challenging, for sure, not, not being wimpy about it, but making sure that's really what you want. Because if you're going to go to battle for that in, in those dark moments, you got to have the wherewithal to fight through it. So anyway, once you lock the, your sights on that destination and you've really thought it through and connected with your those that care about you and gotten advice, like, do, I wouldn't do that in a glib manner. But once you know what that is, then I think you start to reverse engineer it. What are the steps that you need to take right down to now? And back to that principle, start before you're ready. I don't think that you have to have a crystal perfect, you know, well-engineered bulletproof plan. I think some of it isn't finding out what's the last step you're going to take. It's what's the first step you're going to take. And you talk about finishing and starting in your, in your works, which I've read all, all of and, and absolutely love. But to me, it's like, okay, if that's the plan, what's step number one? And how am I going to like measure it and put some early points on the board and start to gain some momentum? And a lot of it isn't coming up with this plan and then having blinders on and just dogged persistence. It's willingness to like adapt all the time. So to me, it would be like locking in the plan, figuring out the first step, and then every day or every short time frame, recalibrating your next step based on where you are now versus where that destination that you're shooting for. I love that. And that's that ties back to that revision principle. You're doing revisions, you're doing revisions, you're doing revisions. Two last questions. One, um, we talked a lot about time, compressing time, um, making sure that you you know are smart about time. How many hours on average are you working a week? Like average, like no judgment if it's a billion, no judgment if it's 10, no judgment. I'm always curious when I meet other people that I would go, wow, they are locked in on their goals. They are passionate about what they do. In an average week, how many hours are you working? So I would say, just as a quick disclaimer, um, I, I sometimes have a hard problem, you know, and you know, you're not my therapist, but I'll, I'll just share, like, I have a hard time sometimes relaxing. And I'm not saying it one of those like humble, yeah, boastful yeah, you things. Mean, you're in a safe place. You're in a safe place. Trust me. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not saying like a humble brag at all. Like, I mean, it's actually a problem like I need to like work on. So for me to sit down and watch a football game, like I get antsy and, and itchy and stuff like that's That's a bad, that's a flaw. It's not, it's not a feature. That's yeah. a flaw. So what I tend to do personally is I feel I, I enjoy work because I don't think of it as work. I think of it as play and I like creating stuff and I'm always in a kind of creative mm-hmm. mode. So I get my like juice from doing that. So the answer to the question is I probably work 65 to 70 hours a week, but it's not because like I feel a burden or like that's what my job requires. It probably has to do more, more with my own wiring and insecurities than anything else. I know people that are way more successful than me that work way fewer hours, to be clear. I love that. I love the idea because I'm the same way where if we go on vacation, it takes me a couple of days to settle into the vacation. And the first three days are me just kind of like feeling itchy and scratchy and like, on my honeymoon, again, this is not a positive thing. 
on my honeymoon by day four of laying on the beach, I went and found a ping pong tournament and won it. And my wife was like, where have you been for the last four hours? And I was like, I needed to compete in something. And she was like, why? We did, you didn't even like know that tournament existed. And I was like, yeah, but I, I really, and that, again, that's a flaw, not a feature, but I'm the same way in that if you love what you do, it's hard to draw that line to go, okay, here's, you know, here's where I end work because I'm passionately connected to the things I get to do. Last question. I will um, say just really quick, John, just just to build on that. I'm sorry. But um, so when I was in college studying music, I had a professor and I was like stuck. I plateaued playing music. And I was like, all right, I got to practice more. I got to be more disciplined. And he's like, yeah. Josh, Josh, go feed the pigeons for two days. I'm like, what is that? Is that like a scale? Is that a chord progression? He's like, no, no, like go to the park and feed the pigeon. I'm like, wait, yeah. is that like a metaphor? He's like, no, like get yeah. in the park, put your guitar down, go feed the damn pigeons. And I did it because I, I respected him. And what happened is getting away from the work actually made my work yeah. better. So sometimes it's actually better to have, you know, multiple influences and have more diversity of, of ideas and, and thoughts and experiences that actually inform your work and ultimately make it better. So that's something I need to work on, frankly. So for me, that's, that brings us back to the reason I like the Lego sets as books is that none of the rest of my life has steps. And I like following the steps because it turns off my brain. And I'm able to go, here's the next thing, here's the next thing. And then I get all this kind of side creativity that comes up because I mean, it's like for some people, knitting is the thing that turns their brain off and they do knitting. For me, it's like, okay, here's a 4,000 piece, you know, Porsche Lego set. Okay, I'm following the instructions, following instructions, and it quiets my brain enough that creativity can kind of come in on the side of my life. So I, I, I love that example. It's something that's, I think a lot of people that do this kind of work or are connected to what they really care about have that same, okay, how do I relax conversation Last question, speaking of passions, you're passionate about Detroit. Like if I said, if I made a list of people that was like, this person represents this city to me, this person represents this city, you represent in my head, it's you and probably Kid Rock. Like you represent Detroit to me. You love Detroit, you hold events in Detroit, you're, you're pro Detroit. Where does that love come from? And what's something that most people, because the majority of my audience is not listening to Detroit. What don't they know about Detroit? Why do you love it? Well, thanks for asking. Um, I, I really am passionate about it. So first of all, I was born in the city of Detroit, not the suburbs, the city. And not my parents, Troy, not Utica, Detroit. Detroit. As were my parents, as were my grandparents. So I have sort of deep roots in this community. And to me, um, you know, it's funny. I've always felt like a misfit a bit. Not, not better at all, usually worse. But if there's 20 kids in a room, there was like 19 of them and one of me. And I kind of like yeah. being from the town that isn't where everybody else is from. So that's that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But Detroit is it's it's such it's steeped in history. It's a city with a soul. There's so much creation that happened here from the auto industry to to Motown music and on and on. And it's also a city that isn't perfect. And I, I kind of love the imperfections. And I love that there's an opportunity to to leave your fingerprints on it and make a difference. Like if I went to San Francisco, there's no way you'd say the person that I think about when I think about San Francisco is Josh. You'd be like, who? What? This guy's even the top thousand. Yeah. So I kind it's not. Not a big fish in a small sea thing. It's more about the ability to effectuate change and leave your mark. And Detroit, to me, provides that. It's to a degree a blank canvas waiting for artists of all shapes and sizes and types to come on in and paint a little bit on the canvas. So I think it's a cool spot. And it's just, there's also a really richness of people. There's like, you know, it's obviously a very diverse city. And a lot of, there's just like real groundedness as opposed to the flightiness that you might see in other cities. I don't know. There's a real richness and soul in the city that I just, I'm in love with. Can't get past it. Well, I, I love that. I, it comes through anytime we get to uh, connect. Last question. Where can people find out more about you and your work? We'll link the book, but say I listen to this and I was like, oh man, I, I love his approach. And, and maybe if you don't even want to be a public speaker, like I'd love to know more about how he thinks or maybe book him for an event. Where do people find out more about Josh Linkner? Thanks for asking, John. And um, even before that, I just want to say thanks for having me. What a great conversation. I just always enjoy our chats. Um, so if you want to learn more about me personally, just my website is my name, joshlinkner.com. If you're interested in learning about the book, it's biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Even if you don't want to buy the book, there's some really good stuff there. There's a free assessment tool. There's a quick start guide. There's a bunch of downloads and tools. So if you're looking for just a free toolkit to get your creative juices flowing, check out biglittlebreakthroughs.com. And then finally, if someone is interested in becoming a professional speaker, our business is called Three Ring Circus and the number, the numeral three and then ring circus spelled out. So three ring circus dot com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we link all of that. Josh, it's always fun to connect. Um, I think we get to see each other this fall, maybe um, in Nashville. I'm, uh, I'm holding on, holding on to that, that hope. But 
Love what you did with Three Ring Circus. I got to personally go there. So that's a that's 100% a real endorsement. Um, love the book. Love how you, you do your life. And I think that you've encouraged a bunch of folks today on the All It Takes a Goal podcast. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, man. Thanks for listening to my interview with Josh Linkner today. We'll put all the links in the show notes as always. And thank you, huge thank you for reviewing my podcast. It might not feel like a lot, like if you throw a couple of sentences on there and you're like, this is the best podcast ever. It was an awesome podcast. I know you might not feel like that's a lot. That's huge. It's gigantic to me. And so I'm so, so grateful. Those reviews are so important to podcasts like mine that are newish. So please make sure you subscribe or follow or whatever it is the kids are doing these days. And please write a review. Last but not least, big thank you once again to our sponsor, Remodel Health. Visit remodelhealth.com slash analysis and get 50% off by using coupon code ACUF, A-C-U-F-F, 50. That's ACUF, 50. That's it for this week. I'll see you next Monday. And remember, all it takes is a goal. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the All It Takes is a Goal podcast and to get access to today's show notes and exclusive content from John Acuff, visit acuff.me slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the All It Takes is a Goal podcast. podcast.